Hey everybody, I'm really glad you found Suncrest Messages. I do hope you'll take a minute to subscribe to either our podcast or our YouTube channel. And you can also download the Suncrest app. There's great stuff there that goes far beyond these messages. Either way, I hope that the next 30 minutes helps you integrate faith with your life. Enjoy. I wanna start with the three frames that I started with last week when we kicked off this series. Three ways to think about this teaching series and that are important to me in the midst of it. One is that we're talking about Jesus and how he would encounter different people. I want to talk about not just what Jesus would say, but the posture that he would take with someone else. And one of the things we know about Jesus is that he was a wonderful teacher to crowds, but you can learn a lot about his interactions with individual people. So in some sense, the series is all about Jesus. Another thing I mentioned last week is that I want to do my very best to represent the people I'm talking about in the fairest way possible. I've had the experience myself of people misrepresenting me or misrepresenting something I stand for or something I believe, and I hate it when people do that, and I do not want to do that. And so I want to be careful about building a caricature of someone only to be able to knock them down, but to do my best to be honest and represent them well. I found that to be more difficult this week with Harvey Weinstein than it was with Ellen last week, in part because Ellen has a lot more information about herself out there. There's endless numbers of quotes and things. There's not as much of that with Harvey. And in part because I'm predisposed to like Ellen and to hate Harvey. The third frame, though, is the notion that over these three weeks, we're talking about well-known figures. But I'm never going to talk to Harvey Weinstein, and this series isn't so much about Ellen and Harvey and Pope Francis next week as it is about us. I believe that well-known people, celebrities if you will, are in many ways simply a reflection of us. And as many of you know, part of the process for deciding who we would even talk about over these three weeks was a survey I gave to all of you and asked your friends to help us out. You had 16 options, and none of these three was I more surprised that you chose than Harvey Weinstein. And I've had some conversations with people to say, why do you think Suncrest, or why do you think friends of people at Suncrest, out of 16 options, chose Harvey as one of the top three? And there's some different theories out there. Um, There's a theory that says, oh, We just wanted to see Greg squirm. (laughs) Fair enough. Someone said to me, and I, I could get my head around this. Someone said to me, Greg, I think we wanted to choose the most despicable person we could think of to see if there's anyone, Greg, that you would just tell they're going to hell. Okay. I have a theory about why Harvey Weinstein shows up in our top three of the selections you've made. And I think it's because the story around Harvey Weinstein, not necessarily he himself, is something that really comes close to our own lives. So I started to theorize a little bit about the crowd that I'll teach to this weekend Let's say that there's 1,000 or 1,200 adults that pass through this room this weekend. I have three categories of people, and they're categories that you might fit in. At least one of the categories, but maybe more than one. So no doubt, within this room, over the next three (laughs) worship services that we have, there are people in this room who are just like Harvey Weinstein. I don't think it's a lot, but in a crowd our size, maybe 20 over the course of the weekend, which means maybe five here tonight, you're doing the things that Harvey did. You are a sexual abuser, 
Or maybe a little more broadly, you're an abuser of your power for your own gain. And I don't think that's most of the crowd tonight, but I know, I know there will be people sitting here who are that. And I want you to listen to this message tonight. A much larger crowd in, these room, in this room over the three services will be a crowd of people who have been sexually abused. You know, leading up to these messages, I try to talk to a lot of people about the messages. And what I was struck by over and over again, whenever I was in a small group of people talking about this message, it would become obvious there's someone in the group I'm talking to that this is very personal to. And it's not because they're an abuser. It's because they were an abusee. That might have happened in the workplace for you. That might have happened at a home, at the hands of a family member. It may have happened at a school or a university. And if we could just be completely honest, it might have happened at a church. There aren't places that are just immune from people abusing their power in this way. And I am overwhelmed that there are probably hundreds of people sitting here who've been on the receiving end of this abuse. And then there's one more category, which I think more than half of us would fit into. And that is, you're aware of abuse that's happening somewhere, maybe at your workplace or any of the other categories I mentioned, and you're aware of it. And so far, you've been quiet about it. And you'll need to figure out, what's the right thing to do when I'm aware of something and speaking up about it is at the very least uncomfortable and at the most might cost me dearly? What do you do? And so I'm going to spend some time in the midst of this message talking to all three of those audiences around the person of Harvey Weinstein. If you don't know Harvey Weinstein, let me give you the short version of his life story. He was born in Queens, uh, New York. He was born to immigrant parents who he cared about a great deal. He ended up going off to college to the University of Buffalo. And after he went to the University of Buffalo, he and his brother Bob stayed in Buffalo and just in their 20s set up a promotion company that was promoting concerts and things like that. By their late 20s, they had decided to start a movie studio, a pr production studio. And they called the studio Miramax. Miramax is actually named after their mother and their father, Miriam and Max. And for most of the 1980s, that studio lived under the radar for the most part. They, they were not well known. They would work with independent films and, and such. But in the late 1980s, they actually got a break, ironically, by producing a movie called Sex, Lies, and Videotape. And it catapulted them into a larger scene. And in the 1990s, Miramax, the company led by the Weinsteins, dominated Hollywood. In the 1990s, they received over almost 40 Academy Awards for films of theirs, many of which you would know and have watched. It continued. In the year 2003, they were actually nominated in one year for 40 Academy Awards, the most that had been done in 60 years. And their wealth, their power, their prestige increased significantly. One of the most fascinating statistics I saw about Harvey Weinstein was there was a survey done of people who were thanked the most publicly during the Oscars over a 50-year period. 
And when you look at the graph of who was thanked the most, take a look at this. Number one, Steven Spielberg. Number two, a tie between God and Harvey Weinstein. That's the kind of influence that he had. Fast forward to October 2017, when allegations surfaced, when a New York Times report came out and started to document a number of women accusing Harvey Weinstein of sexual assault and rape and harassment, of using his position to get favors and sometimes doing things that were illegal. Dominoes started to fall very quickly. Within days of the report coming out, the Weinstein company that he had started fired him. The board of governors of the Academy of Arts and Sciences expelled him within days of it coming out. Shortly after that, new names would trickle out each day. Some of the names of people he that were claiming he abused them are very well known. Ashley Judd, Gwyneth Paltrow, Angelina Jolie. Most of the names aren't so well known. But more and more would come out up to the point where over 80 women have publicly accused Harvey Weinstein of abusing them sexually. This, of course, was at a time in our country that correlated with the Me Too movement. In fact, there's a phrase, it's literally called the Weinstein effect that speaks to the idea of the Me Too movement and that it generated enough momentum that when enough accusers feel bold enough to say something, it will go public and names, popular names that we all know, started to fall. And so with that context, let's just imagine for a second that Jesus and Harvey end up in a conversation. What would that conversation look like? Well, I'm going to draw from an image of a conversation that Jesus did have in the scriptures Um, You may know the story of Jesus and Zacchaeus, and as I read the beginning part of this story, I want you to just picture, instead of Zacchaeus, Harvey Weinstein. This will help us a little bit. Here's how it goes. A man was there by the name of Harvey. He was a sexual abuser, and he was wealthy. Now, I don't know if you think, oh, Greg, you're putting Harvey in a category that's way beyond Zacchaeus, but I promise you I'm not. Tax collector fit in the same category. It's the kind of person who, because of their power, took advantage of other people and would do it at will, and the collateral damage would be massive. They were the outcasts of society. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but because he was short, he couldn't see over the crowd, so he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him since Jesus was coming that way. So you have this moment where the sinner of all sinners, a person that nobody in the crowd liked, they all despised him, was trying to get a glimpse of who this Jesus was as he was coming by. How's that going to go? When Jesus reached that spot, he looked up to him and said, Harvey, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. I don't know how that makes you feel. That the encounter with Jesus, with someone who's despicable, would be an open invitation to to go to his house and welcome him gladly. If you feel frustrated by that, you're in great company. Because all the people who saw this began to mutter, he has gone to be the guest of a sinner. Now, this is one of the wild things about Jesus. That Jesus will engage in a conversation with anyone with no preconditions. Sometimes I use this chart. I won't spend much time with it today, but the idea that we cr- the world was created perfectly, it became a very broken place. Jesus brought redemption and then restoration to the world. I just want you to see this chart for a moment for the, 
the context of what it is. It's when sinful things happen, it generates all kinds of brokenness in this world, and Christ has come to bring redemption for that. And maybe this is an interesting question to you. Who are you more like? Are you more like Jesus or Harvey Weinstein? Just you. Who are you more like? And I will suggest to you that the answer for every person in this room, including me, is that I'm more like Harvey Weinstein than I am like Jesus. That speaks not to how horrible of a person you are or I am. It speaks to the uniqueness of Jesus and the ability for someone like that to encounter someone like Harvey or like us and bring them toward redemption. Now, I'm going to call time out on the Zacchaeus story for a second and shift to a different story that I also think would maybe reflect the kind of interaction Jesus would have with Harvey. This is one where Jesus was talking to a woman who was kind of an outcast. She was sitting by a well in the heat of the day by herself. And as Jesus is talking to her, he starts to talk to her about very personal things in her life, including her relationships and her sexual sin. That's how the conversation goes. It says, he told her, go call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. And Jesus said to her, you're right when you say that you have no husband. The fact is, you've had five husbands and the man you're with now is not your husband. What you have said is quite true. And that's a very fascinating thing to say if Jesus and Harvey were going to have a conversation, would Harvey be honest with Jesus? Sir, the woman said, I can see that you're a prophet. What's happening here is Jesus has knowledge. He has no ability to know any other way. There's something unique about this person. But it's interesting. She calls him a prophet. The woman said, I know that Messiah, called Christ, is coming. When he comes, he'll explain everything to us. Now, this is actually kind of interesting, given one slice of Harvey's life that we won't talk about much, but Harvey is Jewish. Now, when you say someone's Jewish, sometimes that means they're ethnically Jewish. Sometimes it means they're religiously Jewish. Sometimes those things go together, although they don't always go together. And I was not able to find in all of my research whether Harvey's Jewishness goes beyond his ethnicity and to where his faith is. But if Harvey were in a conversation like this, it would probably go exactly like this. Harvey would say, hey, I know there's a Messiah that's coming. And Jesus would declare, that's me. I'm the one you're waiting on. But then the fascinating part of the story to me is the woman leaves Jesus, she goes back to her town to to find the people that she knows, and this is what she says, come, see a man who told me everything I ever did. If you're one of the five people in this service right now, who is Harvey Weinstein, who's a sexual abuser, who's an abuser of power. I want you to know, God knows. God knows. He knows everything you've ever done. And if that strikes fear in you right now, it should strike fear in you. If you think for a moment that you're going to get away with what you've done without ever coming clean, God knows, and you should not presume that. You know, the instinct in most people who have done things wrong, this is true for all of us to some degree, is is to say things like Harvey or his attorneys have said. This is one of the things that attorney said, I'm not here to say he's not guilty of committing sins, but he's not a rapist. My goodness, the the effort that almost all of us go through to minimize what we've done. This is the phrase most of us use. Well, I know I'm not perfect, but 
and then you let yourself off the hook for whatever you've done. God knows what you've done. And if you're trying to tell God, God, it wasn't that big a deal. I I would not try that with God. Here's something Harvey did say when all this came out. He said, I came of age in the 60s and 70s when all the rules about behavior and workplaces were different. That was the culture then. And you justify your behavior because times have changed and I was just going with the flow. And and you set your standard at what the culture was instead of your standard at what's right and what's wrong. And God knows. God knows. If you're a person who's hiding your sin, I'm asking you to just be honest. I'm asking you to come clean. I'm asking you to stop hiding it, to stop minimizing it, to stop relating it to some situation you can justify and be honest. If your abuse is in your workplace, I'm asking you to walk into your workplace and admit it. And of course, most people can't even picture admitting it. Why not? Because after you picture admitting it, you picture the fallout from it and the fallout is too great. What it might cost you your job, what it might cost you, your family, what it might cost you. And most people can't come to terms with admitting what they've done wrong when they think about the consequences that would come, so they don't admit it. And I'm telling you, God knows. And you're afraid of the fallout that's going to come when you say it out loud here. And you should be afraid of something much more than that. Let me speak a word to the victims. And sadly, this is only going to be a brief word in this message. If you've been a victim of someone abusing you, I want to say in an invitational way here today is, I want to lead you to a way, to a place where you can forgive. But I don't for a moment think that I can stand here and in 60 seconds say, so if you've been a victim, your job is to forgive and just move on. I, I, don't, I can't say that. You, you, the pain, what you've gone through is so great. And there's a few things you'd need to know. I'm not... I'm not asking you to forgive in order to let the, uh, the abuser off the hook. One of the most powerful things about forgiveness is it gives you a chance to start over. And actually, as I was in all these conversations and this keep, kept popping up, like people I know who say, I got a story, I was abused. I just decided right then and there that before we get to next summer at Suncrest, I'm going to do a full series about overcoming things in your past that have hurt you. Jesus says this. He says, if any of you hold anything against anyone, forgive them so that your Father in heaven may forgive you of your sin. And I know that's probably not enough for you tonight, but if it could just be the start of an exploration to say, what would it actually look like to work through this in my life so that it doesn't keep me in prison? That's what this forgiveness is. And then, of course, there's a conversation about power. Jesus said this, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And here's what Jesus is describing. 
about the, the structures of power in our world. He says it's almost instinctive that when someone gets power, they use that power to lord it over other people. He says, look around. This is the way, this is the, way the broken world works. People gain power, and then they use that power for their own benefit. And the truth is, if we could all be honest about this, the instinct that all of us have to sin or use other people or abuse someone else, a lot of times you might think to yourself, well, I'm no Harvey Weinstein. But the truth is, if you had the power Harvey Weinstein had, you would be just like him. Sometimes we use King David in the Old Testament as an example of someone who, is, who did horrible things. He, he cheated on his wife, and then he had that woman's husband murdered. And I think, well, probably no one in this room has cheated on your wife and then had their husband murdered. But here's the thing. Most people just do what they can get away with. David was the king. That's what he could get away with. However much power you have, you use it to get away with what you can get away with. And Jesus says you have to be very careful around power. You see, one of the saddest things about the Harvey Weinstein story when it broke is that everybody knew. I mean, the New York Times article ran in October of 2017. But when you're let go by your own company within days and the Board of Governors of the Academy of Arts and Sciences convenes a special meeting to expel you within days, what that means is everybody knew. One of the documentaries that's been done about Harvey Weinstein, this is so powerful to me, it's called The Reckoning. Hollywood's worst kept secret. Lots of people knew. And nobody said anything. So this is our other group of people here. People who see abuse happening and decide just to be quiet. What do you do with that? Well, these aren't exactly the words of Jesus, but they are the, the words of the scriptures. In Ephesians 5, 11, it says, have nothing to do with fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. And I think one of the things that a follower of Jesus will do when someone is being bullied, when someone is being abused, especially if you know about sexual abuse, is you will not turn your head and just look the other way. It perpetuates the system. And no doubt, we understand why people do it. It's also because of the fallout. There are plenty of people who if they would have spoken up about Harvey Weinstein, would have lost something themselves. There were plenty of politicians and others who benefited from Harvey Weinstein's donations, and so it was in their very own best interest to say nothing at all, even though they knew what was going on. And I'm suggesting to you that if you know and you're part of the structural system that just turns their head. Don't do that. So what do you do? Well, this is a pretty bold statement, so let me talk about it in real life. I think if you're in that situation and you know something's going on, there's just a few fundamental things you need to think about. First of all, your role if you're a follower of Jesus is toward the redemption and restoration of this world, that when you see broken things, when you see things that are not the way God wants them to be, you will not turn your head away, but you will be part of the solution, not allow the problem to continue. At the, at the very least, at the very baseline, 
you will pay attention to yourself and say, am I somehow benefiting? Am I somehow benefiting to, as this goes on, so I'm not speaking up actually because of me? And you should absolutely reconcile that in yourself. To say, yeah, you may not be as bad as the abuser. But if you're getting a a kickback of some sort by not saying anything, you're not that far off. Should you blow up the whole workplace with an accusation? I don't know, maybe, maybe this is the right way to think about it. There is a victim in these situations. And maybe the very best thing you could do is go be there for that victim. To not turn your head away, to be the kind of friend who would walk with them. Do you know how hard it is to speak up when you're a victim? Some of you know. For some of you, it's too hard. Victims need people to walk with them and to be strength for them and to be their support and to be a soft landing for them. They need someone like you in their life. And maybe it's, it's not your, your role to go public and speak all this up, especially if the victim is, is saying, hey, hold on, let me, let me figure this out. But you at least have to be there for the victim. And then quite possibly you should be a whistleblower. And I know that word, like, can I even say that out loud without it being political in today's environment? I hope I can. But you would be part of the solution, not someone who perpetuates the problem. So let me go back to Jesus' encounter with Zacchaeus or Harvey. As horrible as they are, all the the awful things that it seems like Harvey has done. One of the messages from Jesus to him and to you, and especially to you if you're one of those five, is you can still come home. You can still come home. I will forgive you. I, I'm going to the cross for these very things to pay for this sort of price. It is as simple and as difficult all at the same time as being honest and facing the music. But it's totally possible that you could still come home. A number of years ago, I was standing over here after one of our worship services, and a guy I knew from our church brought me someone who I didn't know, and he introduced me to him, and he said, hey, I brought this guy to church today because he's done something. It was something horrible that he'd done. It's illegal what he had done. And he said, before we go to the police station, I wanted him to come to church. And I had this conversation with that man, right, standing right over here. And I looked him in the eye. And I said, you can be good with God today. And if you'll face what you've done with God, if you'll just be honest about it, you can experience cleansing and forgiveness. And we should pray about that right now. And then just so, just so we're clear, as soon as we pray about it, and, and maybe you'll be good with God, you still need to go to the police station. Like being good with God doesn't keep you from the police station. But you can actually make things right with God. In the conversation that Zacchaeus was having with Jesus, it says, Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, he said, look, Lord, Here and now, 
I give half my possessions to the poor, and if I've ever cheated anybody out of anything, I'll pay them back four times the amount. He was owning it. He was being honest. He was ready to make amends. He he knew that he had sinned against God, and he knew that he had sinned against people, and he knew that, that what he had done was wrong, and what he did put people through hell. And he said, I'll own it. And I'll never be able to make up for everything I did, but I will try. Because I know the damage. And as I've told you before, Jesus did not say, no, Zacchaeus, that's okay. No need to go make things right. That is not what Jesus said. When he saw that Zacchaeus had come face to face with who he was and the consequences of what he would, had done and is ready to make it right, Jesus said, today, salvation has come to this house. And so I think those are the choices in front of all of us. Whether you are the abuser, whether you are a victim, or whether you're someone who knows and is staying silent. I think Jesus has messages for all of us. I want to pray about that right now. God, I thank you that Jesus is full of truth and grace. And I pray that we would be like him with others and I pray we'd be honest with him about ourselves in Jesus name Amen Well I really hope that was helpful for integrating faith with life Listen if you're in Northwest Indiana I'd love to have you join us in person Head over to suncrest.org and plan your visit